Hello and welcome back to Oxygen Not Included. In today's episode we're going to be taking a look at two buildings, the thermal aqua tuner and the steam turbine, and how they can be combined together to create a very powerful cooling solution for your base. At some point when you play Oxygen Not Included you begin running into heat management issues, either because you just have so many buildings in your base that are generating heat that eventually your base gets too hot, uh, or you begin electrolysis of water which leads to 70 degree oxygen and hydrogen which needs to be cooled down, uh, or you encounter some sort of vent or volcano or something that is producing a lot of hot stuff that you want to cool down so you can use it in your base. Uh, and in the early game, your heat management solutions are a little bit limited. Usually they are either dumping your heat into some sort of cold biome that you found somewhere, right? Moving the heat somewhere else, kicking the can down the road. Uh, or they are using the ice machine. And I've created a couple of videos already on the channel on how you can set up your ice machines in a very effective way uh, to get the, 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 all the cooling that you want out of them. Um, but as you progress through the game, your heat management solutions are going to become more and more extreme, and you're going to want more automated solutions, things that don't require duplicate labor and can process a lot more heat effectively. So to that end, uh, we have turned to the steam turbine and the thermal aqua tuner because I believe this is basically what Clay intends for you to use in the mid to late game to manage the heat that you encounter in the game. Um, so let's discuss each of these buildings in turn, and we'll start with the thermal aqua tuner. What does the thermal aqua tuner do? Well, if I go to the plumbing overlay here, we see that I have polluted water entering this thermal aqua tuner. And it exits through this port right here. This is the entry port, this is the exit port, and then I, it exits on its way. This polluted water is coming in at 53.4 degrees right now, and we see that it is leaving at 39.4 degrees. The thermal aqua tuner will reduce the temperature of any fluid pumped through it by 14 degrees. All right? and it will take all the heat that it is removing from that coolant, whatever that coolant is, and output it to its immediate surroundings. It will heat up itself, and because it's in contact with whatever gas or liquid is around it, it'll heat up that area as well. So, um, this thermal aqua tuner, because it is using polluted water, and because polluted water has a fairly high specific heat capacity, can I click on contents? What's going on here? Uh, well, if I can click on water, Polluted water has the same thermal capacity as uh, polluted water, and that is a specific heat capacity of 4.179. I'm processing 10 kilograms per second through this uh, thermal aqua tuner, and I'm reducing its temperature by 14 degrees. So if you run the math, it's uh, 10,000 times 14 times 4.179. You are uh, transferring, effectively, 585,060 DTUs per second from this coolant that you're running in, in this case water, to these surroundings. Now, if you use a different coolant, something that has a lower specific heat capacity, the thermal aqua tuner will output less heat. It'll still reduce the temperature by 14 degrees, right? But because there's less heat trapped in those 14 degrees that you're removing, uh, it's going to output less heat around it. So to get sort of the maximum efficiency out of your thermal aqua tuner, you usually want to use a material that has fairly high specific heat capacity as your coolant. Uh, that way, the power cost that you're paying, which is not insignificant, 1,200 watts per thermal aqua tuner, you're basically getting the most out of that power, right? Um, polluted water early on is going to be the best coolant that you have available. Uh, later on, you'll gain access to super coolant, which is roughly twice the specific heat capacity of water. Um, once you get to that, you'll probably want to be using super coolant in a lot of these builds. Uh, but for now, this is intended sort of as a mid-game build. Polluted water is what you're going to have access to. And the reason we use polluted water as opposed to uh, just normal water is that polluted water has a little bit wider of a band in terms of where it boils and where it freezes. Um, polluted water, let me pause and see if I can just select some polluted water here. Um, hmm, maybe I just need to spawn some here. Let's go ahead and create a little bit of polluted water here just so I can show you the difference in the difference in properties. Uh, water of course freezes at zero and boils at 100. Meanwhile for polluted water you get roughly a 20 degree extra on that band. It, it freezes at negative 20 degrees, it vaporizes at 120 degrees roughly speaking. Uh, and so that's going to give you a little bit more flexibility in terms of what the temperature is of uh, the coolant that you're running into your thermal aqua tuner. In particular, one of the things I'm doing is I have a liquid pipe thermosensor. 
This is sensing the temperature of the water that goes into this thermal aqua tuner and is making sure that if the temperature is below zero degrees, that it turns this thermal aqua tuner off. Uh, the risk that I don't want to run here is I don't want polluted water at negative six degrees, let's say, to go into this thermal aqua tuner and come out at its freezing point, freeze inside the pipes and break the pipes that are uh, exiting these, this thermal aqua tuner. So this liquid pipe thermal sensor is basically set up uh, to turn off these thermal aqua tuners when uh, the, the coolant is cold enough. This might not be a problem for a lot of your builds, right? You might already have just a lot of great ways of uh, keeping your, your system nice and warm. But if you're worried about freezing the coolant in your pipes, this is important. This is a little important piece of automation. And basically what I have done as well, if we go back to plumbing, is I've created a sort of uh, an outlet if the this thermal aqua tuner is turned off. So this thermal aqua tuner is off. Uh, what will happen is the water will continue looping around, right? It'll pass this thermal aqua tuner. It'll reach this uh, liquid bridge and bridge over to the output line of the thermal aqua tuner. So in the event that the thermal aqua tuner is off because the coolant is too cold and we wouldn't want to freeze it, I have it simply bypass the thermal aqua tuner and continue looping around, right? Something along this these lines is important to have if you're worried about this freezing effect. Uh, you can build this in a number of different ways. It doesn't have to be like this, but this is roughly the setup, right? The, you have the water enter into the entry point of this thermal aqua tuner first, and then if the thermal aqua tuner is off, you have it go to a, get a liquid bridge, which will then bridge back on to the outlet line of this thermal aqua tuner. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Uh, basically prevents one of the failure modes that you have to worry about. Other failure modes, of course, include this room getting too hot, but because we have these steam turbines here, which I'm about to talk about, uh, we don't really need to worry about that in a big way. Um, this is really the only automation you need. And even this is sometimes overkill for a lot of the systems that you're looking at. But that's just here to make sure we don't freeze our stuff because the thermal aqua tuner will do that. It will take your coolant and freeze it and break your pipes if you're not careful. So we've included this little uh, safety valve here to uh, to make sure that doesn't happen. So it's it's cooling down the coolant by 14 degrees, but it is taking all of the heat that is trapped in that coolant, in that 14 degrees difference, and it is outputting it to itself, basically, right? This thermal aqua tuner is generating heat proportional to the amount of heat it is uh, taking away from that water. So in this case, 10 kilograms per second of polluted water uh, is being reduced by 14 degrees, and there's a specific heat capacity of the water of 4.179. If you multiply that all together, it's uh, outputting basically 585,060 DTUs per second to this room. It's taking 585,000 DTUs and uh, removing it from this, this cooling line and outputting it to this room. And we're using that heat to generate steam. And this is where the thermal aqua tuner is moving the heat, right? It is, it is transferring heat from the, whatever liquid we're putting into this room. Uh, the steam turbine is then how we're going to get rid of that heat. So now that it's kind of clear what the thermal aqua tuner does, uh, let's talk a little bit about the steam turbine. So the steam turbine takes in steam and the steam has to be at least 125 degrees before the steam turbine will turn on. And it operates up to, uh, up to 200 degrees Celsius. It'll take in steam of 200 degrees Celsius Beyond that point, you're really not getting anything. Beyond that point, you're at peak efficiency. There are little things that you can do by blocking some of these inlet ports. There are five inlet ports with the steam turbine. Each one is taking in 0.4 kilograms per second of steam. Uh, with higher temperature steam, you can block these uh, entry ports and still have the steam turbine running at peak efficiency. Potentially, the steam turbine produces as much as 850 watts. Uh, here, for this steam turbine, for example, we are producing 712, 710 watts uh, because we're not using 200 degree steam, we're using 183 degree steam. Um, so we're not running the system at peak efficiency yet. Eventually, if you ran the system long enough, this room would reach, reach 200 degrees, I believe. Um, but for now, uh, also, I guess it wouldn't quite reach peak, peak efficiency because this is a ceramic tile. Uh, which is a, kind of bleeding a little bit of the heat in. Ceramic is a more sort of realistic insulation material than something like insulation, which you're not going to have early on. But in any case, the steam turbine is going to take in that steam two kilograms per second across its five ports, and it is going to reduce its temperature to 95 degrees. It is going to output, if we go back to this plumbing view, it is going to output 95 degree water which can then just be dropped right back down into this steam generation room. There's, you know, you can have this on a closed loop pretty easily. Um, 
I'll talk a little bit about why I have this pipe snaking around here a little bit. Uh, but the, this, almost all of that heat is just deleted. We are taking, in this case, 184 degree steam and turning it into 95 degree water. And almost all of the heat, and that is a considerable amount of heat, is just being deleted from the game. It's gone. Some fraction of it, I think around 10%, is being generated by the steam turbine itself. The steam turbine has a base heat production rate of four kilodTUs per second, uh, but it will take about 10% of the heat that it is deleting and release it to its surroundings. So the steam turbine will need a little bit of cooling to, uh, to stay within a, a reasonable temperature range. Uh, in fact, if the steam turbine goes above 100 degrees, it will stop working. So this is another failure mode that you need to work, work around. Um, this is something that you're going to need to consider in designing your steam turbine systems. It's possible that you have the steam turbine just exposed to the air, that your duplicates can run around through this room just fine. Uh, this is particularly relevant if you are using this in conjunction with some sort of power room, right? If you're using the, um, the power plant and you have a power control station and you're putting little tune-ups on your steam generators to get more power out of them, then you'd want to cool down this room even further than I'm cooling it down right now. I'm basically keeping it just one, under 100 degrees. Um, and a way to do that would simply be to put a bunch of wheeze warts in the room. Um, just so you have a rough idea though, expect your steam, steam turbines to be producing somewhere around this amount of heat, right? 76 kilo DTUs for a sort of reasonable setup. And one trick though is if you were to take in something like a thousand degree steam. If you were to superheat the steam, you wouldn't actually get more cooling than using the 200 degree steam because beyond that temperature, the steam turbine is going to generate all of that heat, right? So up to 200 degrees, it is going to um, it, it is it is going to only output about 10% of the heat that it is deleting. But beyond that 200 degrees, uh, or basically beyond that sort of maximum amount of heat deletion that it provides. It's just going to it's going to create all of that heat in the steam turbine room, so you can't really trick this thing to delete massive amounts of heat in that sense. You can't just superheat the steam to like a thousand degrees, eleven hundred degrees, right? If you made these out of thermium components, you can't do it like that because a lot of the heat would just get transferred to the steam turbine room. It would only still be deleting the same amount, um, but this is still a very significant amount of heat that's being deleted. And if you run the math. Um, because we're taking two kilograms per second, which is one fifth of the amount that these thermal aqua tuners are using, we have the same uh, specific heat capacity that is uh, in the steam as the polluted water, right? And because this is a 14 degree difference and uh, 105 degrees, which is the difference between these 95 degree stuff that is coming out and the potentially 200 degree stuff that is coming in, uh, 105 degrees divided by five is 21. 21 is one and a half times 14. Uh, two steam turbines exactly can cover the heat generated by three thermal aqua tuners. The, the, the math lines up that way simply because of the degree differences that are created in the game, right? These are each running 10 kilograms per second at a, a difference of 14 degrees. Uh, this is running 105 degree difference, but it's running it at, uh, for only two kilograms per second, one fifth of the amount, right? And in any case, Two steam turbines per thermal aqua tuner is a good setup. Um, it will mean that these thermal aqua tuners need to be steel. Uh, if you did it one to one, these thermal aqua tuners could probably be gold and you would get away with it because it would, the, the sort of um, steady state temperature in this room is gonna be lower, right? There's gonna be less heat deleted by the steam turbine. It's gonna be at a lower power level. The steam is gonna be colder, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But for steel components, this works just fine. Two steam turbines can exactly delete as much heat or exactly remove, I should say, it's not deleting all of it, about 10% is being dumped into the steam turbine room, but it can remove as much heat as three aqua tuners generate. So this is a great ratio. This is a nice little compact build. Um, a few notes on keeping your steam turbine room cold. Um, in this case, I've decided to enclose my steam turbine room, right? I'm not interested in having a power control station and doing any tune up. So I might as well just enclose this room. Uh, and I'm using basically two methods to keep this room under 100 degrees. Beyond 100 degrees, the steam turbine will stop working. Also important to note, steam turbines have an overheat temperature of 1000 degrees. This is com completely irrelevant really because these steam turbines will stop functioning at 100 degrees. But you can it means you can build these things out of anything, right? You can build these, in this case, out of aluminum, which is a pretty good metal for this. You can build them out of iron, you can build them out of whatever. Um, but back to the cooling solution. 
I have, of course, the water that's coming out of this steam turbine absorbing some of the heat, right? It starts off at 95 degrees, and as it continues down here, we see that it reaches the temperature of around 97.5 degrees, right? I mean, this one is a little bit colder than this one uh, for reasons that I'll get to in a bit, but this is going to help cool down our system when these steam turbines are operating at sort of peak efficiency, right? It's not relevant when the steam turbines are under their peak efficiency, like if I have these thermal aqua tuners uh, not running a good fraction of the time, then the, these these won't be, uh, we'll basically just be taking the 95 degree water and dumping it right back into here. But when we're operating at peak efficiency, um, these pipes are going to help with the cooling just a little bit. It doesn't have to be much, right? Because we're only trying to absorb about 10% of the heat that we're deleting. Um, but yeah, this is one line that helps out. And then I've also created this little hydrogen loop here. Um, and this hydrogen loop, we see the hydrogen that's coming down here is at 96.6 degrees, right? Which is uh, basically the heat that is grabbing from this room here. Um, and then it is dumping that heat into a pool of water that I have just underneath this setup. So these thermal aqua tuners, as they go about their cooling loop, are first cooling down a room that is being used to cool down these steam turbines. Any simple loop like this is fine. Uh, I think it's neat to have the, the steam turbines basically cool down themselves, right, by having this little extra room here. Um, you don't necessarily need this to be water. This could be granite tile. This could be, I mean, anything really, as long as it isn't vacuum and there's some way for heat to transfer. Um, then you can make this room out of basically anything. I like water because it has a high specific heat capacity and also gives me a, a good kind of at a glance uh, look at whether or not there's a problem. If this water has turned to steam, then I know there's something about to go wrong in my system. But high thermal capacity for me is a nice thing because it kind of lengthens the amount of time before some of these things can become problems. Like if I, for whatever reason, started overheating these steam turbines, um, this would delay the process by more than if I had some really thermally reactive material in here. But again, this can be basically anything. You can make this granite tile. Um, you don't even need necessarily the system. Uh, this is looping, by the way, because I have a, a gas bridge in the system. So basically everything that is coming out of this outlet says, oh, there's an input over here. I should go to it and follows this chain. I have insulated tile in the areas I don't want to exchange heat. I have uh, radiant tile in the areas that I do want to exchange heat, in this case made out of aluminum ore, which is a fantastic fantastic material for these purposes. Um, and yeah, the, the system will just then cool down itself. You can't quite get by uh, with just using the, uh, the outputs here uh, in terms of cooling down your steam turbine. There is a lot of heat in water that is uh, going from 95 degrees to 100 degrees. But at, when you have three thermal aqua tuners, if you're using the steel thermal aqua tuner setup, you'll need additional cooling beyond this, right? Because this, I mean, we can run the math. This is around 75 kilo DTUs. 75 kilo DTUs is about the amount of cooling provided by both of these uh, sort of lines right here. If both of them were taking 95 degree water, two kilograms per second of it, and turning it into 100 degree water, this is around the order of enough to cool down one steam turbine, but not two. So if we had fewer thermal aqua tuners here, then this line could be used to cool down the steam turbine itself. Um, also would allow us to use gold uh, thermal aqua tuners. But again, I'm showing sort of the, the, the top end build, right? Um, and that means including a separate uh, sort of cooling loop. So these cool down themselves uh, and means using as many thermal aqua tuners as we can use per steam turbine. Um, and basically trying to get as much efficiency out of the system as possible. Um, again, you can go to gold if you want to. It's a simpler system, it's easier to set up, but uh, this is what we're using here. I've also, in this room, this steam turbine room, dumped just a little bit of ethanol. Ethanol is fantastic as a, uh, a cooling gas because if I'm able to click on the ethanol gas here, ethanol gas has a fairly high thermal conductivity of one. Whereas uh, something like hydrogen is gonna be like 0.124. We're mainly concerned with thermal conductivity. We want a lot of heat transfer from these pipes uh, to these steam turbines. We want a lot of heat transfer from our hydrogen cooling loop uh, to our system over here, right? Um, ethanol is a good choice in, in that regard. Also, it has the nice feature that it condenses at around 78 degrees. So if we're not running the system at its peak efficiency, if, right, because the coolant is already cold enough, we have some of these thermal aqua tuners off, what will end up happening is this ethanol will condense. It'll 
be just on the ground right here. And this heating line that we have for our, um, right, this sort of uh, recycling system that we have right here will basically turn off, right? That uh, there won't, this, this room will be vacuum with a little bit of ethanol down here. And so this hydrogen cooling system will be able to interact with it but this uh, heat exchange system will not. And so this 95 degree water, instead of being cooled down by this room, would then remain at 95 degrees and continue going back into here, right? We don't wanna cool down this fluid before it goes into this room uh, because that just lowers our efficiency. We wanna heat it up if possible. Um, but this, I think ethanol is really neat for that, that purpose. Just putting a little bit in here, right? Just having a bottle emptier, just kind of empty one or two bottles into this room is enough to just kind of coat the ground with a little bit of ethanol. Um, that'll mean that when the system is colder, uh, we're not exchanging heat with uh, this re heat recycling system uh, and will mean that we're still getting the cooling that we want. And also ethanol gas is just a fantastic gas to put in this room uh, in the high heat scenario. So it works for everything. Ethanol gas in its current state, fantastic as a, as a fluid to put in here. If you don't have access to ethanol gas, um, hydrogen works just fine. Hydrogen is a pretty good gas. Really anything, as long as there is some environment in here that is reasonably thermally conductive, uh, you'll be fine. Hydrogen is kind of the classic one that a lot of people use, but with the advent of ethanol, ethanol is a great one to use. So um, we've kind of discussed a lot of the core components of the system. The thermal aqua tuner, which is uh, reducing the temperature of its input fluid by 14 degrees and dumping that heat into its immediate surroundings. The steam turbine, which is then taking that heat in the form of steam and deleting it, turning it back into water, right? We've shown off the sort of self-cooling system for the steam turbine. And this is a very powerful system at the end of the day. Um, you are going to, again, um, have to spend some of your cooling to cool down these steam turbines. Uh, but at the end of the day, each of these steam turbines is deleting about 800,000 kilod or 800,000 DTUs per second, roughly speaking. We're not operating these at peak efficiency, so maybe they're only deleting something like 700,000 DTUs per second. But that is a lot of heat. That is a lot of heat to delete. Um, I've got a great video showing various heat options. 700,000 is way up there. Most buildings in the game are only going to be producing something like uh, 4 or 2 or 1 or maybe 9 or 10 uh, kilodTUs per second. This is deleting, right, 700 kilodTUs per second. So um, this can really help you cool down a lot of stuff in your base. Um, in addition to that, I mean, I guess uh, one more comparison. The... Uh, polymer press, which is what you use to produce plastic, only produces 32.5 kilodTUs per second. So um, with just one of these steam turbines can cool down the output of roughly 20 polymer presses. Um, so this is a very powerful cooling solution here. A few notes on some of the other stuff that I've connected to it. You'll note that the power does not balance out, that we have three thermal aqua tuners per steam turbine. Um, but these steam turbines, at least in their current mode, are only generating 700 watts a piece, right? And at their max, they're only going to generate 850 watts a piece. That is not enough to run your thermal aqua tuners. So you are going to need an additional exterior power supply. Now, in this case, I've just put up a bunch of hydrogen generators. This could be coal. This could be manual generators. You could have dupes running on wheels. That's probably not the most efficient thing to do. Um, but, you know, some other external power is going to be needed to apply to the system, right? Because this system is not self-sufficient. Um, you want to have a smart battery usually attached to this external power supply. And that smart battery will turn off this external power supply uh, at a certain point. So here I have the smart battery say, go on standby at 85% uh, fullness and turn back on at 30% fullness. So um, this basically means that we see it climb up to 85 and then it will start falling down to 30. And once it hits 30, these will turn back on and then it will start generating power again. This ensures with this smart battery setup that our steam turbines are always running. The point of the system is to run these steam turbines, keep them running because we want to continue deleting heat. We don't want to be using power from this system if we don't have to. We will need to use some power from the system because this is not self-sufficient on power, but we want to have a smart battery set up with the automation wire that I have right here connecting to the automation ports on whatever power uh, systems we're using. Again, this could be coal, this could be natural gas, it could be whatever. Um, but we want to make sure we use these as a secondary power source relative to these steam turbines. 
Again, uh, like I've discussed with power before, you wanna have all of your power sources on one side, a battery in between, and your power consumers on the other. So that's basically what we're doing here, right? These all feed into the battery. Uh, these all feed into the battery and then the battery is connected to this end right here There again is not much of a risk of a sort of brownout with this system because uh, we are using heavy watt wire Heavy watt wire unlike regular wire is uh, rated all the way up to 20 kilowatts Normal wire only goes to 1 kilowatt conductive wire only goes to 2 kilowatts uh, Again because I have three thermal aquatuners here and each one of them is using 1200 watts We're gonna need something that can at least handle uh, 3600 watts Heavy watt wire is the easy answer. And that means that we're going to have to have heavy watt joint plates breaking our insulation at some point. The simple answer to keep your insulation and still have these heavy watt joint plates is just to have a room, a vacuum room in between them. So here I have, right, these heavy watt joint plates that are connecting to the rest of my power grid uh, separated by a gap of vacuum between them, right? This gap can be even smaller if we kind of put our heavy watt joint plate here and put our line of um, ceramic right here. But the point is, uh, it's really easy to insulate if you use a little bit of this vacuum uh, trick to, to keep one thing thermally separated from another. We see, right, this heavy watt joint plate, because I made this room really cold, is really cold. This one's really hot, but there's no heat transfer between the two because this is just vacuum. So that's trick number one. And then sort of the question is, what do you want to do with all this cooling, right? Because we have in this plumbing... We have all this water coming in. Now it's at 49.5 degrees. It's kind of been cooling off as we've been talking. Uh, what do you want to do with this, this cooling? The easy answer is after you've kind of dumped some cooling into uh, back, back into your, your, um, your uh, steam turbine room, you want to take the rest and usually use it in some sort of heat exchanger system. So I don't really have anything exchanging heat right here. Um, but this is just sort of an example. This, this room full of super coolant is just designed to be something that you're trying to cool down. You basically want to create a cold element, create some sort of thing that you're trying to cool down, and then maybe pipe hot things through it. So for example, if I had an electrolyzer room right here, I could have it take the oxygen and pump it through this heat exchanger room that I have right here. And it's basically going to take all the cold that is being produced by this system here and try and transfer it to the oxygen, right? Um, this can be a lot of things in your base, and so I'm just using this as sort of just a placeholder. Um, but basically the idea is this is the room that you're going to cool down. Right, that right now it's at 50 degrees, which is why the, uh, the water is coming in at 50 degrees, right? That's the, the, what it's been heated up to after it's uh, taken its coldness and dumped it out into this area. Um, this will continue cooling down if we were to run the system even longer, right? And eventually this, this whole system would freeze because I don't have any source of heat coming in. But your source of heat coming in could be just things coming from an electrolyzer room. It could be a, a cool steam vent or any sort of vent that you're trying to cool down. It could be a volcano. Um, the important thing to consider, I guess, in the system is that because we're using polluted water as our coolant, uh, we, we do have to worry about boiling that polluted water, right? That uh, water, polluted water will boil at... Uh, 120 degrees we don't want to have our pipes break so you can't in this system because we're using a coolant that has a an upper limit on what it can reach um, we want to make sure that we aren't trying to cool down something that's too hot because the the polluted water will boil inside of our pipes and break our pipes and that would be bad for our system but anything within that range right anything within that range of um, basically negative 20 to uh, 120 is the range that we can change the temperature of other things too, right? We can cool things down all the way to negative 20 if we like by um, just you know letting the system continue to run. That's the temperature to get all this stuff to if we let it go uh, long enough. Or we can cool down things that are as hot as 120 degrees. Um, and some things that are a little bit hotter, you can kind of cool them down as long as there isn't that much thermal mass, if you can kind of get on top of them quickly. So that way your polluted water very quickly drives the temperature below what the boiling point of the polluted water is going to be, then you'll be fine there, right? You can cool down things like um, carbon dioxide vents, right? Carbon dioxide vents are going to produce their carbon dioxide at 500 degrees. You can still cool them down very easily just because the thermal mass of that carbon dioxide is going to be very low. And so your polluted water is just going to have, your, your polluted water is not going to reach 120 degrees, even though the carbon dioxide is 500 degrees, just because thermally the polluted water has so much more mass than the carbon dioxide. But uh, just some limitations on the system as it works right now. Of course, this changes as you replace your parts. Um, once these uh, thermal tuners are running off of things like supercoolant as opposed to polluted water, 
uh, that changes things. You can, if you want, use something like crude oil or petroleum, which has a much higher boiling point as you're cooling through the system. Uh, it will be less power efficient because again, uh, crude oil and petroleum have something like half the thermal capacity of uh, polluted water. So you're only going to be getting half as much heat generated by these thermal aquatuners if you use that as your coolant. Um, and so you're still gonna be pay paying the same power cost of 1200 watts. You're just gonna, this system is gonna be just less efficient, right? But you could cool things down that are, uh, that are hotter than that uh, by using a different coolant in your system, right? Um, so the choice of elements in these in these things is important. Um, in particular, what you're using as the cooling fluid, the working fluid for your thermal aqua tuners. Um, but other than that, you're probably pretty good, right? Um, there's there's a few other choices you can make. One is to not use thermal aqua tuners. There is another option, uh, which is to use something called a thermal regulator. A thermal regulator, uh, just to kind of slap a few down right here. Uh, and also, uh, by the way, just in case you didn't know, uh, these buildings, a lot of buildings in the game, in fact, can be reversed, swapped like this. That's what I've done with these steam turbines, why they're kind of facing different directions, uh, by pressing the O key. Uh, not all buildings in the game can be swapped like this, but a lot can. So if you want, you know, your pipe outlets and inlets to be at different points, this is the way to do it. Um, these thermal aqua tuners or so, sorry, these thermal regulators will use gases as their coolant as opposed to uh, as, as opposed to fluids. There's, there's kind of two issues with them. The first is that gas pipes, gas ducts, uh, can only carry one-tenth as much material as a liquid pipe. So even though these thermal regulators are also going to be reducing the, uh, the temperature of their inputs by 14 degrees, same temperature difference as the thermal aqua tuner, they're only, only going to be doing it for a tenth as much material. So that's a little bit of an issue. Um, the other issue is that gases typically have lower specific heat capacities than uh, the fluids, right? So a polluted, polluted water, for example, has a specific heat capacity of 4.179. Hydrogen has a specific heat capacity of 2.4. So you're going to get a lot less heating and cooling out of these thermal regulators. Um, the flip side, of course, that's kind of nice is that they cost less power, 240 watts relative to 1200 watts. So for the same power cost, you could run five of these thermal regulators. But again, they're processing one tenth of the material and they're processing it with, with a thermal uh, specific heat capacity of about half, a little bit more than half of polluted water as a coolant. So um, there is that downside. They're gonna be less power efficient but if you wanted to cool different things off, you could you could do that. And uh, a lot of gases like hydrogen will have a very wide range in terms of the temperatures that they, they can accept, right? That hydrogen will remain uh, a gas uh, all the way to negative 252 degrees. And this sort of basis is, is what we're going to use to create things like liquid oxygen. So if you wanted this, if you wanted to run uh, thermal regulators in the system, you can, just be aware you're gonna to have to have a lot more of them to support a single steam turbine worth of output, right? If you wanted to be efficient in terms of steam turbines, you're gonna have a lot more of these. Uh, this thermal aqua tuner is generating in this room, uh, again, 585,000 uh, DTUs per second. One of these thermal regulators running hydrogen is only going to generate 33.6 thousand DTUs. So it's more than an order of magnitude difference that we're talking about. For every single one of these, you're gonna need like 15 thermal regulators. That can be a pretty large room, but uh, it does give you these different options in terms of what you're using as your working fluid. So keep that in mind. Um, there other, are other builds, they're just not gonna look as compact and nice as this. Although they will probably uh, allow you to use things like just conductive wire and not have to do this little vacuum trick. So there are maybe a few benefits, uh, but just something to keep in mind. Um, there are some alternatives. I think that's basically it. So to recap, the thermal aqua tuner moves heat. It transfers heat from whatever liquid is being pumped into it to its immediate surroundings. We're going to use that to generate steam in its immediate surroundings and run that steam through a steam turbine. That steam turbine is going to delete about 90% of that heat, take the resulting water and pump it back into the steam generation room. We have a separate cooling line to keep this steam turbine room cold because 10% of the heat that it's uh, deleting is going to be actually generated within this room. 
We're using two systems to keep this room cold. At high temperatures, we have uh, this radiant liquid pipe from its outputs taking 95 degree water and heating it up to, you know, if this is at say 97 degrees, right? It's gonna take that water and heat it up to 97 degrees before dumping it back into this room. That's one element of the cooling solution. The other one is a simple hydrogen loop between it and the outputs of these uh, thermal aqua tuners. You can support three thermal aqua tuners off of, a, uh, off of two steam turbines. The math works out exactly like that. Um, yeah, and uh, you wanna have some sort of heat exchanger to uh, extract the cold that you're getting from these thermal aqua tuners and transfer it to whatever it is that you wanna keep cold, like oxygen coming from an electrolyzer. And you're going to need an external source of power. It doesn't need to be hydrogen generators, but keeping that external source of power hooked up to a smart battery and having the smart battery turn off these sources of power before you reach 100% battery uh, fullness is a good strategy. Um, I think that's basically it. Uh, this explains everything about the build. There's a lot of different tweaks and ways of integrating these sort of builds into other builds that look really neat. Um, but this is just in terms of raw efficiency, about as good as you're going to get. Other builds may be a little bit more aesthetically pleasing, um, but this one is gonna be pretty straightforward, pretty easy. There are some neat tricks um, way, other ways of generating heat besides these thermal aqua tuners. But this is the very straightforward way of extracting cold from this system, right? Because uh, these thermal aqua tuners are directly transferring heat from their input fluid to their immediate surroundings. That allows you to just very directly use the output fluid as a way of cooling something down. Um, so that's gonna be the very straightforward thing. Again, there are other ways of setting up steam turbines and doing other things, but this is just very much straightforward. This is this is the very efficient, very straightforward, very plain way of doing things. And it's very effective, and I think it looks pretty nice. I think this sort of setup, especially when you have this symmetry going on between these uh, these systems, looks pretty nice. And, uh, and that's it for this episode. I think I've gone long enough already. Uh, hope this was helpful. Hope it helps you out in cooling your base. And uh, that's it for this episode. I'll catch you guys next time.